Well, good morning, Kings. It's a privilege to be here, and it's good to be back. How many of you were here four years ago when my wife and I came through? Would you just give me a wave? How many of you were not here four years ago when, look at that, I love seeing church growth and people change, Um, so it's so nice to meet you. Um, I want to echo real quick what Derek was saying. Uh, When God brought Derek and Georgina into our lives, he really refreshed us. A good friend in life and in ministry is so key and so important. There are four individuals that I would consider friends in ministry that I would reach out to and ask for advice and counsel. And Derek and Georgina are some of those two, two of those friends. They have been tremendous refreshing spirits to us. When they came over to Orlando this last, about a year ago, back in August, Derek brought such a prophetic word to our church that it literally shook us out of a stuck place and set us into a fulfilling promise of God that we've been praying for for two years. I hope you realize that they're not just your pastors. They're, sometimes we can take that for granted and make it common. They are anointed men and women, ministers, the Holy Spirit flows through them, and they will transform your life if you'll give them that freedom in your life. So we're so grateful for the two of you. We appreciate you both for your friendship. Um, And they are who they've always been. That's one thing. I've been around ministry a long time. I've seen pastors and leaders come and go, rise and fall. I've seen them in the green room, and I've seen them on the stage. And I appreciate that who they are in front of you is the same people that they are all the time. And so would you one more time just honor your pastors today and let them know you love them and you appreciate them. Amen. All right. Amen. All right. Well, let me talk to you today because I do believe I have a word from the Lord for you today. Is that okay? Can I just share with you what's been in my spirit? And I don't want to exclude this powerful group over here. Hi, powerful group over here. Hello. Look at me up here. Look at me. Awesome. Nice to meet you guys. How are you? I love how you worship. You guys are amazing. I want to fly you all to Orlando. Can I do that? Is that okay? Awesome. Awesome. If you give me a lot of amens, we'll talk about that, all right? Awesome. Well, praise God. I want to also celebrate your building. You didn't have this building before we came. This, we are standing in the middle of a dream, in the middle of a miracle, and I just want to celebrate that with you. Are you still grateful to God for this blessing that you're in? Can you just celebrate Jesus right now for that? Amen. That's a big deal. We must be a grateful people. We must always stay thankful for the promises and the blessings of God. We do live one hour from the magic kingdom. So that kind of says something, I guess. When my wife and I go out on dates sometimes, we'll head to the magic kingdom for a date or to Epcot for a date. And so it's a blessing and a privilege. But you know what? It's not about the magic kingdom. It's about the kingdom of God coming to that city. And I want to tell you a little bit of that vision and that story that God brought us through And why he brought us from Illinois to Orlando. And I hope it helps you because all of us are on a journey. Say journey. God has a vision and a plan and a dream that he places inside of each one of us. And it's important that those dreams and those visions come to pass. God doesn't give you those visions and those dreams to make you feel good about yourself. He gives you visions and dreams because they're a part of his kingdom plan that needs to come about in the earth. And I want you to carry it like that. Sometimes we think God spoke to me so he made you feel good about yourself or gave you a good esteem. But it's not about that. It's there's a need in the earth. There's someone that needs you. And and they need you to be a finisher in that plan. Not just a starter, but a finisher. Say finisher. Now, I also want to be here today to help awaken dreams and vision and plan in your heart again, too. Because all of us came out of COVID. That whole COVID season, I believe one of the side effects of that was it put the earth and the body of Christ in a survival mode versus vision mode versus taking and advancing the kingdom. Now we just wanted to survive. We wanted to get through it. And now we want to protect ourselves from any future crisis. And so we live in a mind space of self-preservation rather than kingdom advancement. And I hope today I can shift you back into kingdom advancement. Somebody say amen. All right, there you go. I'll even cue you on that. Is that all right? So I want to shake off that COVID hangover, I like to call it, where we're just sitting there trying to self-preserve. 
and live a safe life. We were never called to live a safe life. We were called to live a significant life. And so I want to bring you into significance today. I want to help you catch vision for your life. You can say, well, that's for the young people. Well, if you want to pass it off to the young people, you're forfeiting the vision of God for your life. If you're still on this earth, God still has a plan for your life. The Bible tells us in the book of Acts that God pours out his Holy Spirit on men and women, and they begin to dream dreams and have vision. It's a side effect of the Holy Spirit. Come on, that's exciting. And so God will take anyone who's willing. You could be 120, and if you're willing, God will still use you. So are you willing today? Are you willing? So God wants to give you vision, dreams, but he wants to help you become finishers today. Because too many people start a journey with God, but they won't finish the journey. And I want to give you some understanding. The Bible says, with all you're getting, get understanding. It's important because while you're on a journey with God, there are going to be things that you don't understand. There are going to be delays. There's going to be setbacks. There's going to be challenges. And if you don't realize that's part of the journey, that's part of the process, then you could give up halfway through. Or you could think you're doing something wrong when you're actually doing something right. And some of that turbulence, some of that persecution is just part of the process. We're going to use that word a lot today, process. Say process. Process. All right, let's talk about it just for a little bit today. We were with you four years ago when the Lord launched us on an incredible faith journey. I would be honest, it's probably the biggest journey and the biggest faith-stretching season of our life. Uh, for those of you who don't know us, we were in Chicago, Illinois, just north of it, for about 16 years. We had planted a small church. God had blessed it. It had grown into something really special, beautiful, multiple campuses. Uh, we had built a Bible college. I had tremendous uh, voice and influence in the state of Illinois in the Assemblies of God. I'd become a leader of leaders there. It was great. And God, along that journey, gave me a dream one night. Do you know God still uses dreams and visions? That that didn't go away with the book of Acts? And I'd read about dreams for a long time. Matter of fact, beginning of that year, 2019, I had done a little study in my journal about dreams. And God showed me in Matthew chapter 1 and chapter 2 how God used dreams, real dreams, four times to move Mary and Joseph and Jesus to where they needed to be. To protect them, to align them, position them for what God was going to do. And I'd written it in my journal at the beginning of that year that God still uses dreams, but that when God gives you a dream, that he's expecting immediate, decisive action. God doesn't just give you dreams to dream. He's trying to position. He's moving you. He's speaking something that needs to happen and come to pass. And he did that for me about seven months later. In my dream, the Lord told me to lay down our churches, to lay down our influence, to lay down our familiarity, our security, to pack up just like Abraham which I guess it's kind of not a big deal. I mean, I guess you realize that God would do this because God's done it in Abraham, but it's one thing to preach it in a Bible school or preach it in Sunday school. It's another thing when God tells you to pack up everything, sell all you have, and go to a land I will show you. And when God would, if God would have spoke that to me when I had nothing, it wouldn't have been that big of a deal. But God chooses to speak that to you when you have security, when you have influence, when you've created roots and established some things. And sometimes we don't like change. We, 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 we like success, and then we fight to keep success at all costs. We don't realize success in the kingdom of God is just being obedient. It has nothing to do with what you actually have in your hand, because sometimes he'll ask you for what you have in your hand, and success is you giving it back to him if you ask him for it. It's not success if you keep it in your own hand. Am I talking too fast for you? All right, just check it. Because there was a couple good places in there for amen, and I, I was just making sure. I was just making sure that I wasn't talking too fast. But God put us on a faith journey. And God asked us to lay down everything and to go somewhere that we had no job. Nobody was asking us to come. But in my dream, God showed me a place. God showed me a building. He showed me a church. I didn't even know it was a church. I thought it was just a metaphor when God showed it to us. And so we laid down our church. We said goodbye to everyone. And the day after we left, that week after, we resigned everything we knew. We had no idea what God was about to do. My family was in complete faith and transition. We got on a plane, and we came to King's Church. And you received us, and you spoke life into us, 
and you prayed over us, and you even celebrated the fact that we just did the craziest thing that we'd ever done in our entire life. And you didn't, you didn't look at us and say, man, you hope that works out. You really, <laughs> good for you. Like you got, you came around us as a church and you supported and breathed life into us. And I have to thank you because that first week out of that was the scariest thing. But we came here and your pastors and you as a church were truly life-giving, refreshing cup of water to us. And I want to thank you for that. And I, I know you're probably that way to everybody, but you, when I say that you hold a special place in our heart, you are a part of this story. You're a part of our journey, and we consider you family in the Kringle household. Can you give yourself just a hand of applause for being a great church, full of life, speaking life to others, celebrating the move of God, seeing things that be not as if though they were, and celebrating it like that? That's who you are, kings, and you're living in that here as well. I want to talk to you about cake. <laughs> He's like, that's a weird transition. <laughs> it got really emotional, and now we're talking about cake. But I can kind of get it, because cake's kind of emotional. We have lemon drizzle cake. Can I get an amen on that? Yes, Lord. I want to talk to you about cake. And here's why. Because on the front of this box is the vision. On the front of this box is the dream. <laughs> I dream of cake. On the front of this box is the vision. Say vision. On the back of this box is the process. Say process. Did you just hear what I said? On the front of this box is the vision. On the back of this box is the process. How many times do we want the vision, but we don't want to go through the process? Come on, that's who we are as people. I'm there. And I know if you can take this illustration and you'll be like, well, I'll just go down to Tesco and buy a cake. Or I'll just go down to Asda and buy a cake. But listen, if you want to make a cake, if God wants to use your life to create something, he's going to start with the vision, but then he's going to take you through process. You're not going to bypass this, my friends. You're not going to be able to just shout and pray and worship and sing and get a couple prophecies and skip the steps but that's who we are as human beings. We want the dream. We want the vision. Remember, you're a dreamer. You're a visionary in the kingdom of God. And so I'm trying to tell you something because who knows when God's about to give you a dream. God's about to speak a vision into your heart. God's going to speak to you in a prophetic word. He'll speak to you through scripture. He'll speak to you one way or another to get you going. He's going to give you the front of the box. He does it with everybody in scripture. He gives them the front of the box, but he doesn't always give you all the steps up front, but he tells you, just walk with me, and I'll walk you through each one of these steps in this process. Part of this is gathering the ingredients. God gives you the vision of where you're going, but you know you have to start with gathering certain ingredients. There are people in your life that you're going to need to meet along the way. There are skills. There are lessons that need to be learned. There's things that need to be transformed and taken out of us, and things that need to be put in us. There are ingredients that need to be gathered in order to produce this. And then, even after those ingredients are gathered, there's another step and process to put it all together and to create what's on the front of the box. Are you following the illustration so far? So I always wanted God to give me a faith story, a faith journey, because I had heard pastors preach faith journeys throughout most of my life in ministry, but I didn't know what it felt like to actually have one. And it sounded so amazing when an evangelist or a pastor would come and they would tell me some story of how God said something. And I'd always see it at the end of the story when they were in their multi-million dollar ministry. And it was completely staffed and people were getting saved every time they sneezed. And it was just awesome. <laughs> but I never knew what it was like to actually walk through something like that. What it felt like. The real human side of going on a faith journey with God. And that's what I want to talk to us a little bit about. Because, like I said in the beginning... With all you're getting, get understanding. And if you understand that some of those emotions you feel are just normal. Some of those things that happen, they happen to all of us. If we can have some understanding, then we won't have fear in that. And we'll be finishers and we won't quit because we start believing the lies of the devil halfway through. Are you tracking with my thinking? All right. I always wanted a God story, but I didn't know what it feel like going through it. Too many times... We want to have a transaction with God, but God is looking for a transformation. 
We want to say, God, I'll do this, and then you're going to do this. Let's make a deal. And God says, you do this. We say A plus B needs to equal C. Does anyone think like that? God says, I say A plus B, God says, will equal whatever I want it to equal. And it'll equal it when I want it to equal that. And I'm trying to encourage you today. God is looking not for a transaction with you. God will lay down my church. God will lay down our home. God will lay down our resources, our finances, our salary, our security. God will lay it down as long as as soon as I arrive in Orlando, there's a job waiting for me. As long as when as soon as I get there, people start clapping and saying, we've been waiting for you. Kevin and Maria, you are an answer to prayer. Here's money. (laughs) Yes, God, that's exactly the way I wanted it to happen. But it didn't happen that way. Because God wasn't looking for a transaction with me. He was looking to transform me and to transform my family and to transform the church that we would become the lead pastors of. And transformation takes time. Transformation takes process. There's that word again. It keeps popping up. Process and journey. And God is doing a great work in you and a great work in me. And so all of these steps are a part of the transformation that God is doing in your life. See, God is not just trying to get you somewhere. God is turning you into someone. Do you hear me, church? God is not just trying to get you, wasn't trying just to get us to Orlando or get us to Calvary, Orlando. God was trying to turn us into leaders that could lead in a pandemic or leaders that could lead after a pandemic because that's actually harder. Are you understanding? Or leaders that could turn a church that was 70 years old around, that had been through every season that you could imagine, every every high point and every low point you could possibly imagine. A church that had seen it all, been through it all, and was very wounded and had a lot of trust issues too. And God was doing something to turn us into someone, not just get us somewhere. God is not just trying to get you to prosperity. He's trying to make you a millionaire on the inside, right? He's not just trying to get you to Orlando or get you to be a pastor or get you to be a be a spouse. He's trying to make you a husband. He's trying to make you a wife. He's trying to make you a father. Are you hearing me? This is transformation. So God is doing something in the steps, in the time, in the circumstances to turn you into someone great, a leader of leaders, a man and woman of God, a prophet in this generation, and they are made. It is not a transaction. They are created through process and time and challenge. Awesome. It's good preaching, I know, right? It's really good. I want to encourage you with a statement. If it's taking longer than you thought, this journey in the front, this picture, this vision on the front, if it's taking longer than you thought, then it's probably bigger than you first imagined. Can you let that sink into your spirit? Sometimes we're like, God, okay, I understand journey, but it's been a year. I mean, I gave you a whole year. If it's taking longer than you thought, then it's probably bigger than you first imagined. There's greater learning, greater lesson, greater experience, gathering of ingredients that needs to happen in order to create what you actually underestimated. Because God has great things in store for you. So rather than saying, I'm so frustrated by how long it's taking, you should step back and say, wow, God, this is so much bigger than I first imagined. I need to take some more time with you. I need to take some more time in your spirit and in your word because this is bigger than me and it's going further than I possibly imagined in the beginning. Yeah. So I want to kind of frame this in the life of Joseph. Are you familiar with Joseph in the Old Testament? Genesis chapters 37 through 50. I'm going to kind of just tell you the story for the sake of time. But I want to walk you through it because I don't want to assume everyone knows who everybody is in the Bible. The Bible talks about Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Jacob later has his name changed to Israel. Jacob has 12 sons. One of those sons is named Joseph. Joseph 
is one of his most beloved sons because he came from one of his wives that he absolutely was crazy about. And he ended up making Joseph a coat of many colors. Have any of you seen the Broadway show, Joseph and the Technicolor Dreamcoat? Raise your hand. All right. It was nothing like that. <laughs> but I'm glad Donny Osmond tried to help us out. But here's what happens. Joseph had a dream. Genesis 35 started similar to our own journey. And in that dream, God shows him the future. And he shows him that he's going to be a leader. He has a dream where um, the sun, moon, and stars are bowing down to him. Yes, it sounds arrogant. <laughs> he shares it to his brothers. They didn't appreciate it. But he had a couple of dreams. But God didn't tell him the journey. He saw the fact that he was going to be a leader of leaders. He saw the fact that God was going to use his life in some dynamic, powerful way. He saw the front of the box, but he didn't know the back of the box. And on the back of this box, some of the ingredients and some of the steps, some of the process included a pit. Say pit. His brothers took him one day and threw him in a deep pit, and they debated whether or not they should kill him. One of his brothers said, probably shouldn't do that. <laughs> then they sold him into slavery because that was better. So Joseph goes from the pit to Potiphar's house. Potiphar is a very wealthy individual. Um, Joseph begins to thrive and succeed in Potiphar's house. And Potiphar says, I trust you. Um, you're a good man. I see the hand of God on you. Everything you touch is blessed. So go ahead and, you know, lead my house. Potiphar's wife thought Joseph was an attractive man. She's like, uh-huh, Joseph. And Joseph's like, no, no, no. And she's like, mm-hmm. He's like, mm-mm. And one day, she truly lays it on thick. She's like, hey, I don't, anyway, I'll keep this family friendly. She says, hey. And he goes, no. And she, he runs out of the room and leaves his clothes behind. She accuses him of sexual relations with her and forcing himself on her. Uh, Potiphar says, how dare you do that? Throws him in jail. So he went from a pit, thought he was prospering. And then he ends up in prison. So he goes from the pit to Potter's house to the prison. Doesn't seem like he's moving forward, does it? It's like, yay, I'm out of the pit. I'm prospering. Now I'm in a prison. What, this keeps happening to me, God. I thought I had a vision of the front. I thought I saw leadership. And every time I get ahead, I keep seeming like I'm going backwards. Have you ever felt like that? Yeah. Every time we get a little bit ahead, it feels like we take this massive step backwards. Then he begins to meet some people in prison. Remember, God is gathering ingredients. God is gathering people in your life that you didn't know you needed that were actually going to connect you to the front of the box. But you didn't know you needed that person. You didn't, because you would not have foreseen what you needed. You didn't even know that person existed. But he meets a baker and he meets a cupbearer, the person that would, you know, drink the or bring the service to Pharaoh. And these two individuals were condemned to be executed. They had dreams. There's dreams again. Joseph interprets their dreams to the baker. He says, Pharaoh's going to cut off your head. That's disappointing. <laughs> to the steward, to the server, he says, God's going to bring you back into, into your ministry again. But he says, please remember me when that happens. And the steward completely forgets about Joseph until Pharaoh has a dream. There's a dream again. You will be surprised if you go through your Bible how many times God used dreams. And God is unchanging. I personally believe God is awakening a season of dreams and visions again in the body of Christ. That's a different sermon. <laughs> Pharaoh hears that Joseph can interpret dreams and he says, bring me. Remember the connection through the, through the wine, the cupbearer, brings him in front of Pharaoh. And so Joseph comes in front of Pharaoh because of the testimony of the guy that was in prison that met Joseph. He says, I know a guy from prison that can in interpret your dream. And so Joseph comes in, interprets the dream. Pharaoh says, thank you so much. You, it's exactly what we needed. And a matter of fact, you are so anointed. God's hand is on you so strong. I want to make you second in charge of all of Egypt. And I need you to help us because there's a famine coming. And you have been perfectly designed and positioned to be the leader to help us through that famine. That's the story of Joseph. Can we give God's word just a celebration for the story of Joseph?
Yay, we had our Bible story moment. Did you all track that story? All right, just making sure. I want to say something about Joseph's life, and I want to say it about all of us. Joseph went from the pit to Potiphar's house to the prison to the palace. And too many times in our life, we look at it like, oh, I was just getting ahead, and now it looks like I've just been thrown backwards. We're just going forward, and now we lose money. We just go forward, and all of a sudden, this group of the church decides to leave and go do some squirrely thing on their own. We just get forward with our kids or with our family, and something breaks or some expense comes in, and now we have to go all the way backwards. Have you ever felt that way? Raise your hand if you've ever felt that way. About half of you. The rest of you, you're amazing. <laughs> Tell me how you do you, how you do. Listen, here's what I want to say about this. This is very important about to say. In each of these moments, when we say Joseph went forward and then he went backward, the truth is this. Joseph was always going forward. Did you hear what I said? Only in our temporal mind was Joseph ever going backward. Because we look at it like, oh, he was getting ahead in Potiphar's house, and now he's backward in the prison. But the prison was forward. Because the prison connected him to the cupbearer that would connect him to Pharaoh's house. The prison was never backward. Matter of fact, the pit wasn't backward. The pit was actually part of the process to get him to the front of the box. Wow. So my friend, what you may be upset about today or saying, God, you're not being faithful today, or God, where are you in all this today? God may be just stepping back saying, just give it time. Because I've never left you. I promised you I would never leave you or forsake you. And I'm bringing you through process and I'm transforming you, but you're always moving forward. Here's the thing. Circumstances do not tell us the truth. Your current circumstances do not tell you the truth of whether or not you're succeeding or failing. Because you can be in the middle of obedience, and it seems like in circumstances you're going backwards. Paul and Silas experienced that. They were succeeding in ministry, yet they were in prison for doing the right thing, not the wrong thing. And that's what I want to encourage you with in this moment, is your circumstances do not determine whether or not you're being a success. In God, the only thing that determines whether or not you're being a success is obedience. If you've obeyed God, you're a success regardless of what that current circumstance looks like, because circumstances are subject to change. Obedience is what's going to cause whatever comes after that current circumstance. It's really good. And I hope that today you receive that, because I, I want to breathe life into you. If you're in the middle of a pit moment, if you're in the middle of a prison moment, if you think your life has been going backwards, but you have been obedient to what God has spoken to you, my friends, you are the biggest success story in this room, because you consistently obey God, regardless of the circumstance, and he will prove faithful. He will prove faithful. Amen. Hearing from God and obeying him doesn't always feel good. I want to help you with that. That's important because, again, our young people, here, listen, God's going to call you to do some great things. He's going to call us to do things that are bigger than us. And if you just listen to sermons sometimes, you think it always feels good when you're on a God journey. It doesn't. Sometimes it feels scary. Sometimes it feels like you missed it. Sometimes it feels like he's not there. Sometimes it feels like everything's falling apart, but you're right in the middle of the God journey. But if nobody tells you that, you might think you're doing something wrong when you're just a human being on a God journey. And part of that and part of pushing through is the recipe, is the lesson, is the ingredient that God is trying to help you not be moved by what you see, not be moved by what you feel, but to go based on what he has spoken. How would you know that you will be faithful to do what God said if you always feel like doing what God said? If you always feel like you're winning. Let me tell you, sometimes when you're winning the most, you actually feel like you're losing. Because it, on the outside, doesn't look like you're winning. But if you obey God and you stay faithful, you are winning. Amen. 
There were plenty of times that we felt scared in this God journey. Still feel scared in this God journey. Plenty of times we felt like we may have missed it. We gave up all security. We gave up all of our influence to go somewhere where we had neither security nor influence when we went to Orlando. We were running out of money. In America, I know that you have um, medical things that are covered in the UK and in England different than ours. We have medical insurance that we have to purchase and we were running out of money. I have a son, we have a son with cerebral palsy with special needs. He's the twin of my daughter, they're 18 years old. Their medical bills are so big, or his especially, are so big, we could not personally ever take care of him without insurance. We just couldn't. And so we were running out of money. We left, we left Chicago, moved our family, tried to sell our house. Our house wasn't selling uh, to a city that was twice as expensive as where we came from. Our income was, was gone. My wife had a business that began to, she worked really hard, but it just wasn't producing, coming, uh, growing. It actually started moving back the other way. Insurance is running out. Couldn't find a job. I, at this point, am like, God, you moved us here. I know I had a dream. I know what you said, but nothing's working. And the house that we can't sell in Illinois was costing so much money, I can barely, I could barely, emotionally I could barely take it I don't know if you understand what that feels like and you're sitting there saying God did I completely miss it like at one point I thought did I sin did I do something wrong did you kick me out of ministry somehow like did you pull a fast one on me somehow and like because that's where your brain can go because you're like wait a minute I thought the moment I moved to Orlando I'd have a job I thought the moment I moved to Orlando people would be saying hey so glad we've been praying for you to come and we gave away some pretty significant influence and security when we left Illinois. That's not to pat us on the back. I'm just saying, like, we, God, I thought I did everything that you told me to do. And he sent us this church called Calvary Orlando, which I saw in my dream. And so what happens is I knew I wasn't allowed to go anywhere else. Because in the dream, God pointed this church out and said, this is yours, but you have to be willing to lay down your church in Illinois. And so I did that part, but now God, A plus B is supposed to equal C, and they're supposed to accept me as their pastor. But here's the deal. They had a pastor, and he wasn't moving. <laughs> and he didn't ask me to come. And the elders didn't ask me to be their pastor. We literally came in a total obedience. And when I met with the pastor there, I just told him, because I couldn't tell him that God told me that your church was going to be my church. <laughs> I just said, God called us to Calvary, and we're here to serve. And he looked at me and said, well, we don't have a job for you. We don't have any money for you. And I smiled and said, that's fine. <laughs> but in the end, and back in the house, I'm sitting there saying, God, how are we going to make this work? It's one thing if I could have just went and applied at other churches or worked somewhere else, but that wasn't the vision. That wasn't the dream. That wasn't what God said in the front of the box. And so I started applying for jobs that I could be temporary in because I was believing that one day that God was going to call us into that church. So there weren't any jobs at that time. I mean, I couldn't find anything. I started applying to be a waiter at a restaurant, started applying to be an Uber driver to deliver food, started applying to be a postman to deliver mail, couldn't find work at all. It was like God was shutting every door. And so I'm in the middle of this journey saying, God, what in the world is all this? I thought you said. But again, God was doing something in us. God was transforming us. He wasn't just trying to get us to Orlando. He was trying to remind me, I think one thing was to appreciate ministry. Because I got a little big for my britches, I think, back in Illinois. I don't know if that's a good word to say here or not. Is that okay? If I offended you, I apologize. But I got a little too proud, I think, because I had succeed, gotten to a place of success in Illinois where maybe I didn't trust God at the same level as I once was. I wasn't praying on the same level. I wasn't grateful for the ministry that I had because I think I thought, oh, I could just go do ministry anywhere. Are you understanding this? And so when I got to this season, I remember thinking to myself, God, if I could ever be in ministry again, I promise to hold it differently. I promise to value the people, value everything they do and give, value the privilege of speaking into people's life. Because I didn't know that that door was ever going to open again. Because as far as God had said it, I was going to Calvary and our ministry was to stop there. There was no next step. And that's kind of where we were. I'll fast forward it real quick because we're running out of time. But basically what happened was about five months in, the pastor of the church there um, needed an executive pastor. 
Um, he asked around for other people. They weren't available, and so he asked me. So I wasn't even the first choice in that. Thank you, Jesus, for my pride. I was just like, okay, God, I get it. I get it. So you're my second choice. Come on in. He's staying. But I knew working for him wasn't my vision. It wasn't what God said. And he and I's personalities are completely different. And so I also knew going in, this was going to be a challenge working for someone with his personality and my personality. But I did it because that's what God had opened the door to do. Sometimes you, your first step into what God's called you to do doesn't look like the end of a thing. It looks like the middle. And some people say no to the step God's given them because it doesn't look like the end. It's like, no, 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 God called me to be the senior pastor, not the second-hand executive that you didn't really want. Like, do you understand who I am? Are you understanding this, church? Yeah. And too many people say no to the dream, no to the vision. They stop halfway through because they're waiting for the end of the box, and they're forgetting about the middle bits, the middle pieces. And this was just part of the middle piece. And so I said yes. Six months later, he resigns. And he says, you, you want to put your name in to be the senior leader? I said, yeah, I'm, that's, I'm supposed to do that, yes. <laughs> yes, yes, that would be fine. That would be fine. Let's just... If you want me to. <laughs> but that wasn't even easy because there was another gentleman that was there who had been there longer than me that was another executive leader, spoke two languages because he's uh, Puerto Rican and the, half the church is Puerto Rican. And I'm thinking to myself, they don't know me. They know him. And we had just been part of, in COVID, so the church had shut down. So I didn't even have a chance to meet the congregation. They were all gone. And so I literally had zero relationship with the church for them to want us anyway he ends up running for the position I'm running for the position and God works on his heart and life and says it's not your seat so he withdraws his name the elders say we'll go ahead and go with your name and we were elected praise God for all that that was great and that was it'll be three years ago in August so I say that story because God brought us through a journey, and we were being transformed, tested, tried, all these things. We could have quit. And here's the thing. Becoming the senior leader of that church is also not the end of that story. It was now bringing that church out of COVID, rebuilding it. And my friends, it's a massive responsibility, what it is that we're being called to do. I, I can't even explain to you the size of the responsibility, the church, the footprint, or the needs that it has. And I'm doing things now that I'm being asked to do that I would never have known I could do if I hadn't have gone through that journey where God stretched me. See, here's what I learned. I, I don't have the education or the degree to be the senior leader of this church. And you can look it up. It's called Calvary Orlando. You can follow us on Facebook, social media, and you'll see why I'm saying it's a big deal. Um, I don't have the degree. I didn't have the connections to put myself there. God put me there. And I know this, that I didn't engineer my way in, but God set me there, right? And by doing that, I know that God is for me, not against me. And I learned a couple of big deals along the way in this story. I learned to listen, and I learned to obey, regardless of what I see. And that's part of the ingredients I needed to learn. There's a couple of things in this. I'll just finish this real quick. If I were to pour this in here, and I'd pour some oil in, and I'd pour, put these eggs in, there's a couple things I just want to talk about in that, and then I am going to pray for you, and I'm going to be done. The reason I like using this idea of the cake is you put all the ingredients in, but sometimes I like the idea of eggs because there were things in the process that needed to be broken in my own life. Sometimes that journey, that process, is God is trying to break some things off of your life. Are you hearing me, church? There are some habits. There are some ways of thinking. There are some limiting beliefs. There are some, who knows, relationships that God is trying to crack those things, break those things off of your life. And he'll use the process to break you, not in a bad way, but to break you in a way because there's more that's going to come out of you in breaking you open. Do you hear that? But then there's also the oil. Where God 
wants to pour his oil upon you in this season and soak it into you. And you, you, without this oil, you will not have this product. And too many times we try to create this completely on our own and we're dry. And God needs to pour his fresh oil upon you. So there's times we need to be broken of some things. And then there's times we need the fresh oil of God to produce what it is on the front of the box. And last, two, two last things. Here's the part I didn't get. The other part of this process is this. We call it mixing. I don't know what you call it. We call it mixing. But another word for mixing is agitating. Is that a word that you... you, Have you ever been agitated? We, We agitate this. It stirs it up. And there's these times in our life that we are being agitated. When I started working for that other pastor, there were things that we were different and ways of ministry that agitated me. There were things in our journey that agitated, stirred me up. But that's all part of the process where God is putting the oil in. He's putting the eggs in. He's putting the, 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 the sugar and the mixing it all together. Sometimes even when you're being built as a church here and you wonder why are we irritated with each other as a staff, as leadership teams. You know, God uses that mixing it up to help us get all that put together and combine us and blend us into something. We need to kind of have conflict every once in a while. We need to be stretched because we need to know how to forgive. We need to learn how to come into unity. We need to know what that looks like, but it's going to come through agitation. Me coming into agreement with a senior leader that I did not want to follow was good for me because it helped me also then in the future know how to work with my team and my staff and maybe some things I did in my past I didn't realize I did because I was too familiar with myself in leadership. And then the last thing is this. After you have the ingredients and the stirring and the agitating, you have to apply some heat on it for it to become what's on the front of that box. And maybe that's where you are right now. You feel like the heat is being applied to your life. My friend, all that's doing is it's making the cake rise. It's making what God has put in you come to full circle. And guess what? You're about to smell the fragrance of that beautiful cake. But that heat is part of the process. It's not working against you. It's working for you. Can I pray for you? Is that okay? Let me pray for you. Would you stand where you are? Just stand where you are. All right, church. Go ahead and close your eyes. If you say, you know, Kevin, I'm, I am on a journey right now myself, and I just need God to give me some fresh oil, or I just need God to just, just bring me some comfort. I will say that God consistently brought us comfort through that season. There was a person that would pray for us. They'd call us up and say, I got an encouragement for you or a scripture for you. God is cur- encouraging you along the way. But you might just say, Pastor Kevin, I've just, I can tell I'm in a journey. I'm in that season. And I just need just that sense of God just to help me get to the finish line. If that's you, would you raise your hand? Yeah, there's lots of hands. You're in that journey. God has showed you the front of the box. You're in the process. And you just need God to just breathe some life in you and freshen up some things to help you get all the way to the end. He who's begun a good work in you will be faithful to complete it. It may not always feel like he's completing it, but my friend, if you stay obedient, he is completing it. You're never moving backwards. You're always moving forward when you obey God. Heavenly Father, I pray for this room. I thank you for kings. I thank you there are dreamers and visionaries because they are the anointed, Holy Spirit-filled church of the Lord. And God, there are things you've placed in them, put in them, and they may be in the journey right now of that process. You've showed them the end from the beginning because that's what you do. But now, God, they're in all of that. They're in the breaking season. They're in the mixing and stirring and agitating season. They're in the heat season. They're in seasons that feel like they're going backwards. Lord, I pray you would breathe fresh wind into them, fresh oil into them. I pray encouragement into them that you will be faithful to do what you said and help them to understand and be at peace. They're not doing anything wrong when they're obeying you. That God, you're working it out and you're going to work all things together for good because they love you and you are faithful to do what you promised. So I thank you that there are a bunch of finishers today 
the dreams and visions in their heart need to come to pass. This world needs them to be finishers in this. We give you thanks and praise in Jesus' name. Amen.